You are listening to the new man beyond the macho jerk and the new age wimp. Your host is men's coach Trip Lemire. Are you struggling to find a balance between your work and personal life? Do you believe you need to do more before you deserve a break? And are you considering a major change because you just don't see how you can sustain this pace over the long haul? Author and Energy Project CEO Tony Schwartz is here to discuss why the way we're working isn't working and how the best thing for your productivity can be done in your sleep. Welcome to The New Man. Today, we're talking with Tony Schwartz. He's the founder and CEO of The Energy Project. He writes a column for The New York Times called Life at Work. He's the author of Be Excellent at Anything, The Four Keys to Transforming the Way We Work and Live. And he wrote a book that had a big impact on me a few years ago called What Really Matters. Tony, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Uh, so the scenario that, that, that I want to paint here is the guy that he wants to be engaged in his work. He, enjoy, he wants to enjoy what he's doing. He wants to know he's having an impact. He wants his work to have some kind of meaning or significance. And he wants more space in his life. He, he, it, maybe his marriage is suffering or his relationship with his kids are suffering. His body's definitely suffering. He's aging quickly. He's not lit up. Um, and he's unable to see how he can do well professionally and also have the life that he really wants because he thinks he has to get up to some level where he's going to be given this magical permission to then relax and have this space. So he's frustrated, he's exhausted, he's losing hope. And the guys that I talk to get into this place where they, it's all or nothing. Either this job is going to kill me or I'm going to have to jump you know, out of this plane and, and switch careers altogether. So he's, he's scared. This, this is having a big impact on him. Uh, today, I, I wanted to explore a new way to approach his current work so that he's not so drained, maybe he has a new outlook on what's possible. Um, when you go into an organization or you work with individuals, w- paint the picture. What do you see happening before you start working with them? Well, I, you know, Tripp, you've done a really good job of describing exactly what I see is happening, that, uh, you know, we have a an, an unprecedented situation in the world we live in, which is that uh, the demand level has risen at a blinding pace over the last 10 years. In fact, so fast that we almost don't notice how dramatically it has changed our lives. And the, you know, the primary ingredient of that, although there are many, or the primary accelerant of that is um, technology. And uh, technology, not simply, but in, in significant part, because it gives us access to so much more information and so much more opportunity to communicate around the clock, but also uh, more subtly because technology has, in a sense, set the pace that we live by. So it's a tremendous irony. You know, technology was supposed to, or digital technology is what I obviously Mm-hmm. was supposed to, in a, in a sense, free us from some of the burdens and, or put it a different way, make us more uh, productive and efficient uh, because it made it so much quicker to communicate. And I hardly have to tell um, anyone who's listening to this that uh, that isn't exactly the way it's played out. It seems like it's got, it's just, it just accelerated everything. Is that what you talk about by the pace? Is that because- Exactly, exactly. And we have you know, assumed that we're meant to operate at the same speed as our technology. In other words, in some sense, we're being run by our technology now instead of being in charge of it. And it turns out that human beings are not meant to operate at the same speed as computers, um, or they're not meant to operate in the same way as computers, namely at very high speeds continuously for long periods of time running multiple programs at the same time. That impulse in us, that technology has accelerated, has actually been around since the Industrial Revolution. And a simple way to think about it is more, bigger, faster is better. Mm -hmm. That's the primary ethic of the market capitalism for the last 200 years and of the business world most of us operate in. And you know what? You can go more, bigger, faster for indefinitely until 
you reach the limits of your capacity. Now, that introduces a whole new piece of the puzzle that honestly, I don't believe was there for most people 20 years ago. Wasn't there, think about Mad Men and, you know, those guys sitting around the office in the middle of the day and always pouring a drink, you know, before a meeting and, you know, leaving at five o'clock and all of those things that are so unimaginable today. I mean, you know, if you saw a person taking a martini at, you know, two in the afternoon in an office, you'd think unless he was doing, you know, unless he was an alcoholic doing it on the sly. And was it, really, was it really that much more relaxed, or is, or is it easier for us to paint this picture and get on the Regress Express? Or, you know, I, I'm just wondering, was it really I that much more? I don't think it was. I, don't, I, I think the word relaxed probably doesn't capture it, because the reason they were drinking was precisely because they weren't relaxed. <laughs> but but what, what was true is, and this I believe, is that the, the range and intensity of demands was lower. And, and again, you know, you just think about, the fact that if you left your office, whatever time you left your office in 19, not just 1955 or 1975, but even up until 1990, you didn't leave it with a phone in your hand. You didn't have the opportunity to answer email all evening. You didn't have an inflow of constant information through the internet and 5 billion websites, much less the social media. So just those by itself changed the reality so much. And And so where this lands is capacity. And I used that word and I sort of just threw it off that until your capacity, you know, you can, you can work, go more bigger, faster until you reach the limits of your capacity. Well, what is capacity? Well, capacity is the fuel in your tank. It's what makes it possible for you to bring your skill and talent to life. It's the gas in the car. Right, And you don't have to think about it so long as you've got a reasonably full tank. But you know what? For the first time, most of us are dealing with this reality that we often don't feel we have the capacity to meet the demands we face. That's going to freak us out when we're not sure if we can make it through the day or this week or this project. Yes, it's going to freak us out. I'm going to go even further. Um, I think it's actually traumatizing. Now, when you think of trauma, You think of, you know, child abuse, sex abuse, uh, you know, um, war, war, the everyday trauma of American life, of American working life, I believe is now normative, meaning most people in working life are experiencing without realizing it, a level of trauma. Now, I'm not saying it's the same as being on the battlefield in Iraq, but there's a spectrum here, and trauma has very profound impact on every aspect of your experience. Meaning, trauma is essentially when the demand on your system overloads to such an extent that, in effect, you move toward or into dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we see when we go out into the work environment. We see people who can't sleep or don't sleep enough. We see people who can't, whose emotional life is so volatile as a result of the demands they're feeling that they can't make conscious choices, particularly when they're under pressure, and instead they just react. Right. We see people who are fiercely distracted and unable to focus on one thing at a time in an absorbed way, which is the only way to get real work done. We see people, the way you started this uh, podcast today, who feel so disconnected from a sense of meaning that it's hard for them to even get up in the morning and feel motivated to go to work, much less excited about go to work. Mm. Those are all symptoms of overload. Okay. All right. Wow. It's depressing. It's not just, oh... I, I just I don't really dig my job, but none of my friends do either, and we're all kind of running ourselves into the wall. I can see where we just have this this uh, meerkat mentality. We're all kind of doing the same thing, so this is just life, right? But what you're pointing out is that no, this is it doesn't have to be this way, and we're all basically driving really fast into a wall. We're all gonna we're all gonna hit the wall here, and that it's having a huge toll on us uh, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Correct. Okay. All, all all yes, that's what I I think. Now I haven't said yet, though I absolutely am going to now, (laughs) that it doesn't have to be that way. So what's the path out of it? It doesn't have to be that way. (laughs) So what's the path? What does it look like? Paint that picture of what's possible there. The path is a a simple, 
but profound shift in your perspective, understanding of how to be sustainably effective. I'm going to use that word effective to count for satisfying, productive, any number of things that any person listening to this would say they want out of their life, either on or off the job, Mm -hmm. a profound shift in how you go about getting that. Okay. Because again, the assumption is that the way to get it is to constantly push harder, to juggle more balls, to Mm -hmm. spend more hours at it. The problem is that time is finite. So this has nothing to do with a change in the world. Time has always been finite. So you got 24 hours in a day. You got 168 hours in a week. And the way we've typically increased our capacity through most of our lives is to work more time, you know, put in more time. Right. But we've run out of time. There is, there is no more time. And if you're working you know, 10, 11, 12 hours a day, you've actually gotten to the point, whether you know it or not, where you're getting a not only a decreased return on each incremental hour you invest, but potentially some collateral damage from having invested so much. But in any case, there's nobody listening to your podcast today who would say, if I said, do you need help in filling your free time? No one would answer yes. (laughs) Right? So, So time's not a resource we can use anymore to expand our capacity, but demand continues to go up. So what do you do? This is where the paradigm shift comes in. And it's the paradigm shift is to from managing your time to managing your energy. Why? Because time's finite. Energy is something you can expand. You can, there are actions you can take to have more energy. Just think about if you want a bigger bicep, if you want more strength, there's a way that you weight train and you will actually get more energy available to you in that muscle Mm -hmm. and you'll be able to lift more. You can also renew your energy. So there's a way of putting back into the system. It's not just spending it. And then you can learn to use it more efficiently. And when you learn, when you make this shift to recognizing that it's not about the hours that you invest when it comes to creating value, it's about the energy you bring to the hours you work. Then what you're thinking is not how many hours can I put in, but how can I make each hour that I choose to put in the most productive and efficient hour possible? Mm. And the answer then is the very heart of this paradigm shift, which is then you have to start to value in a wholly new way, renewal and recovery. Okay. So we're switching from this uh, time-based you know, value system into an energy-based value system means we've got to pay attention to our energy. And, and we get this. I mean, we totally get this. We all, most of us drive cars. We know that we've got to put gas in the tank to keep going. Somehow we think that we're immune from that as, as men, that we won't have to do that, that somehow like there's a day and a night and a, a, a empty and a full, that we're, we're immune from that, that we're more like the computers that we work with. Um, so let's talk about resistance because there's obviously a competing commitment here. Robert Keegan would use Good the term competing. So there's safety here. He's, he's, tr- he's playing not to lose. He's playing not to lose his job or miss out on some opportunity. He's, he doesn't want to lose the image that he's valuable or strong. So taking off time to renew seems like it's, it's going to tap into a fear of being weak or I don't, I, you know, that there's just something down in there that he doesn't want to deal with or be seen as. So uh, yeah, how, how, do we, how do we work with that resistance as well? Because it sounds like um, your book is so full of statistics and the studies that show that what you're talking about is valid and, and the way to go. And I think we all know that, but it's this resistance that we've got to deal with. Yeah, I mean, you know, bless you for getting to something so essential and fundamental about this because I can blather on forever about the statistics and how right it is. But if there's something holding people back, it really doesn't matter um, because they're not going to do the so-called right thing anyway, no matter how many statistics you give them. Mm-hmm. So, let's, for, so let's, let's just quick take a look at what this resistance is all about. So I think you've hit one of the essential components of it at a personal level is the association between pushing harder and being a man, mm. um, being successful. Uh, being the go-to guy, 
Mm -hmm. you take pleasure then, not pleasure, you take pride, you don't take pleasure, you take pride in the fact that you don't have to, or you choose not to sleep many hours. Yeah, there's like a, take, a nobility about it. Like, I'm self-sacrificing for the work or something. some bullshit. <laughs> or I'm just tougher than you. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't friggin' need the sleep. Mm-hmm. So, you know, go ahead. You can go sleep eight hours, but I got a limited number of days in my life, and I'm not going to spend them sleeping, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> yeah, I'll sleep when I'm dead. That's, right. by the way, as you know, that's a, cl- you know, that's a classic line. I mean, you, you know, you didn't just make that up. That's, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a deep belief system in people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so all of the things that go with both what it looks like to be successful and its opposite, which is what it means to be weak or, or, uh, or, uh, you know, not up to the task or, you know, whatever those things are that we, we all fear right. at some level. Right. So that's one critical factor. Second critical factor is that beyond even your own experience, the convention, the acceptable level, the socially acceptable expectation is that you will work in that way, both in the culture at large and in the organizations in which most of us work. So if you are to start to buy into this paradigm, I said, you're going to look very different than everybody else. And that is very, very challenging for anybody to do. Yeah. So you know, these are the, these, and there are more ways that we resist, uh, change. The third, uh, I'll just say one more change is hard mm-hmm. and you get used to doing things, even if they don't work that well, at least you're used to doing them. And you know that relatively speaking, they're safe to do you. Any change you want to make in your life is o- o- opening you to the possibility that a, it will work worse than it used to. And, and B, you will fail at making the change. Right. So there's a tremendous, you know, uh, uh, energy around just accepting the status quo, even when it's unacceptable. Yeah. So you got all three of those levels of resistance that are operating. So what do you do about it? Because that's really ultimately, isn't that the question you would want to ask? Yes. Yes. So going to Keegan, you know, who, who it sounds like we both admire and respect and, who writes about this whole uh, and, and, and teaches about this whole area of resistance. What we teach people to do essentially is to build small behaviors that test the assumption without changing the game so that the danger level is not so high that the resistance prevents you from doing it. And the possibility in the testing of the assumption is, or the goal is that you will find out whether making a particular kind of change that puts you in a, you know, trying something completely new actually delivers results. Mm -hmm. And that that's fair. Like it's stupid to try to make giant changes. It's like going out after being sedentary and not exercising for five years and saying, okay, so I'm now going to start by running three miles a day at eight minutes a mile you know, and about a quarter of a mile into your first day, you've said, oh God, this is hopeless. And you know, this sucks. I feel worse. Mm -hmm. Or, or you're, or you're half gasping for breath and you just stop because you can't keep going. Right. So what you want to do is you want to bite off what you can chew. You want to, you want to try something that doesn't require much. Let me give you a few examples, please. Renewal. So I've said renewal is a powerful, powerful driver for more sustainable performance. So in other words, give me an example. I used to write books. I was a uh, journalist before I did this work and I continue to write books, including the one you've mentioned, Be Excellent at Anything. And the first three books I wrote, I wrote by sitting at my desk in all day long from let's say, you know, seven or eight in the morning till six or seven at night, you know, anywhere from eight to 10, 11 hours. Okay. And the reason I did it is because it's hard to write. And the only way I could get myself to get some writing done, I thought, was to stay there all day. And despite the immense amount of time I would spend avoiding the writing, at least I would get some done. And that's the way most people I know who are writers write, to a greater or lesser extent. Mm -hmm. 
It's like you hold your nose and you try to do it and, you know, it's painful, but, you know, you hang in there. Yeah. Each of those books took me at least a year to write. Then I learned about renewal. And one of the things I learned is, I mean, many things I learned, but one of the things I learned is that the human body is only capable, the human, a human being is only capable of being completely focused on a challenging task for no more than 90 minutes. Now, in honesty, there are very few people at this stage in the world who can focus in an absorbed way for 90 minutes or anywhere close to it. But there's nobody effectively who can consistently focus for more than 90 minutes on a challenging task. Why? Because we have a rhythm inside us called the ultradian rhythm. And that rhythm moves us physiologically every 90 minutes from a state of high arousal and, and, and alertness slowly down into a physiological trough at which point the body is screaming at us, give me a break. Hmm. And when you don't give it a break, when you override that rhythm, which many of us do, when you keep going, what happens is you begin to rely on stress hormones to fuel you, adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol. Yeah. And those And they beat your body up. Yeah, they beat your body up. So over time, that system is not going to get you high productivity. So what I recognized was that if I could set a start time and a stop time, and that stop time was 90 minutes, and I knew that I could stop at 90 minutes, then it turned out that the having a finish line and knowing that my body was not really prepared to go beyond that anyway, made it possible for me to fully focus like you would in a sprint. Mm. And when I hit 90 minutes, I took a break. I did three of those 90-minute sessions in each of the last two books I wrote, three of those 90-minute sessions, 7 to 8.30, 9 to 10.30, 11 to 12.30, and then I stopped writing for the day. So I wrote for four and a half hours. In between those sessions, I took a break of some kind. One of them, I took a run. Another one, I had breakfast. Another one, I sat and read the newspaper, which is something that's enjoyable to me. But the point is, I was in recovery. I was in renewal. You weren't still working on the book specifically. I was specifically not working on the book and right. specifically not thinking about the book. Okay. I was refueling the tank. I was at the gas station. And so what I, what I discovered was that in both cases, I wrote the books, the fourth and fifth book, in less than six months, working less than half the number of hours each day. Wow. What could be a more powerful proof? So what should you or somebody listening to this be doing who doesn't yet have that vast experience of success at this paradigm shift that I've had. Well, how about something as small as this? What if every 90 minutes you took 90 seconds and just breathed in through your nose to a count of three and out through your mouth to a count of six? If you did a little breathing exercise in which by extending the out breath, the six, you were getting more recovery because in breathing, the recovery comes from the out breath. You're breathing out the carbon dioxide, the toxin. <sighs> That's the out breath. So mm-hmm. if you extend the out breath, you are increasing your recovery. In 90 seconds, it's possible to completely clear the bloodstream of cortisol. Wow. Fascinating. I so love that. If, if you can, there's no who can say to me, look, Tony, that's a great idea, recovery. But do you know my life? I don't have time for recovery. You have time to do 90 seconds of breathing a few times a day. Sure. You can't tell me, listen, it's great for you to suggest that, Tony, but meet my boss. He insists that I be constantly on. No, he doesn't. You will never have your boss come over to you and say, hey, Joe, stop breathing. <laughs> That's not acceptable. (laughs) Stop it. Be dead. Well, Well, that's an example. That's just a simple example of a very small test that delivers a very significant reward and begins to introduce you to a wholly new way of thinking about how you work. Well, this is fascinating because the, on the on the we, we've said you've laid out the case here beautifully, and and that we've also punched some holes in it of those really powerful drivers of the resistance, which is the story we tell ourselves, like, I can't do this. Uh, you know, the work isn't going to wait. But I, I, what I'm getting is that it's not, if we really care about the work, then we'll get out of our own way. We'll, we'll, we'll do the things to renew ourselves. So 
when you're I, the thing I hear is like if you're not taking these breaks to renew yourself, you're making it about you and you're not really making it about your work. So let's 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 get it clear. If you're really committed to doing the best work you can, you're going to t- you're going to take this renewal path. I love it. I love that you're putting the tools to do this in our hands that it's not something that the world has to embrace first and then give us uh, permission to do so. It's not a top, not necessarily a top down thing, but no, you're that, absolutely that, right. That we can, you know, okay, I'm going to test this on my own now. I can, I can figure out the small risks that I'm willing to take and see if there's a return on that. See what actually works for me. It has me feel more energized, has me feel more strong, more resilient. And then take on the next thing and, 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 uh, and just play with that and be willing to, to take those risks instead of, making this all or nothing thing. And I think, cause I think that's part of the old mentality that's gotten us into this mess to begin with. So, uh, um, no, that's a, that's a really, that's a really good point to be making because, you know, part of the growth process is taking more responsibility, being less of a victim, being, you know, blaming less and saying, Hey, yeah, I get the world is tough. You know, there are many obstacles I face, but what I do have the power Whatever I have the power to do, wherever I have the power to influence, it's my responsibility to do just that. Exactly. And that, that's very empowering, ultimately. You know, that's a, that's a wonderful place to go. You can make very, very small changes based on this paradigm I started out today with, which is renewal and refueling drive performance. You can change this most fundamental behavior, which is how much you sleep. If you don't sleep seven to eight hours a night currently, if you don't wake up feeling fully rested in the morning, both of those two things, then you are radically behind the eight ball in every other department of your life. If there's nothing else that you change in your life, but you're willing to think of changing one thing, start with sleep, assuming you're not answering both those questions positively. Yeah. Start with sleep. And everything will change if you sleep one hour more a night. Everything will change. And that will give you a platform to begin to take on more. It's great to have that kind of information that's so practical, especially when we're talking about something that has such an impact on the rest of our life. Where can we learn more about you and the Energy Project? Uh, the best way to learn is uh, go on, just go on the Energy Project website, which has all kinds of tools, and it has an assessment about how you're managing your energy. It's called theenergyproject.com, and uh, it tells you everything you could want to know about us. Excellent. Tony Schwartz's uh, book is Be Excellent at Anything, The Four Keys to Transforming the Way We Work and Live. Tony, thank you so much. Thank you. There's so much more to The New Man than these interviews. So visit thenewmanpodcast.com and join the mailing list so you never miss another update. Thanks for listening.